feature film tonight, I Learn America, is a documentary by filmmaker Jean-Michel Dessart and Gita Peng. Currently on the film festival circuit, it has played in the AFI Docs Festival, Nantucket Film Festival, Flagstaff Mountain Film Festival, and the Hawaii International Film Festival. We are privileged to have Jean-Michel Dessart and two of the students from the film with us this evening. We hope that you enjoy these films and we invite you to stay seated for the panel discussion that will immediately follow the screenings. Thank you and enjoy. My dad said, I'm going to come to the United States. I'm going to be here working three years, and then I'm going to back, go back to Guatemala. He was coming here by halfway in Mexico. He was killed. Across the room, if you are not from the United States. Woo, me! Oh, me. Our students are recent immigrant English language learners from about 52 different countries. You see my country? My country is bigger. They are the American dream. The options are to either nurture and support and educate them or not. It was not a choice for us to come here. That's something our parents choose. Coming here is really hard. I was 10, crossing the desert by myself. We just here on a visa and I mean, we not have nothing. The most difficult part is he can speak in English, you know. Absolutely nobody else speaks his language. If you hit someone and they press charges, you can go to jail. What I want to say, I have in my, my brain, but I can't speak. I can't imagine what they're going through. My dad, like he said, is the age when you were supposed to get married. I feel very nice when uh, <laughs> the children are good. They already chose a boy for me. All the normal <laughs> angsty stuff about being a teenager and trying to figure out who you are and what right and wrong is, on top of adjusting to a totally new culture. I mean, it's, it's insane. You need to realize, wherever you choose to be in this world, it's up to you. My parents want me to put a dress on prom. How am I gonna look with a dress? Something you want and you can't achieve. You just have to suffer. <laughs> a little bit different. Everybody's different here. Different nationality, different people, different dressing, culture, and all of that. I want to go back to Guatemala, but only to vacation. This heart is over there, and the body's over here. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Judith Vecchioni, executive producer of the WGBH Educational Foundation, who will be our moderator for our panel discussion. We are privileged here to have the filmmaker here tonight, Jean-Michel Dussard, as well as two students who were in the film that you just saw. Ah, oh, just one. One, yes. One. Brandon, right? I recognize you. You're famous. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Sandra almost made it, but she had um, midterms. And, you know, it wouldn't be too good. After the, yeah, we asked her to stay in school. Yeah. Um, am I, can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Okay, well, as, as um, introduced, I'm Judith Vecchioni, and I'm an executive producer at WGBH in Boston. Um, it's your local public television station. I'm sure you all know us, Channel 2. Uh, I also work for a new cable venture that public broadcasting is putting together called the World Channel. Uh, it's digital on your computer and cable only, and a lot of international films there too, so you'll be interested in them. I've, say again? You get the world, no, not the world radio. 
No, there's another, there's a television channel called The World Now. I watch it. Well, yes. Um, it's not on your cable system? Well, okay. Good. Okay. Right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm, you're right. Um, just to tell you a little bit that my background is documentary films, so I really, really enjoyed tonight's uh, film. And I've worked on a lot of international subjects and some immigration subjects as well as children. So this is all very, very familiar and interesting to me. Um, let me introduce our first panelist, um, which is, I think I'll start with you, our, our director tonight, Jean-Michel Dussard. Um, Dissart, excuse me. Jean-Michel spent a year filming this film at the International High School, um, creating a wonderful portrait that you've just seen of ups and downs and complications for all these students. Uh, I Learn America is not, however, his first film. You could tell that probably too by, the, by how beautifully it was put together. Um, he's worked on such critically acclaimed films as Raising Victor Vargas, uh, Rikers High, and Ezra by Nigerian director Newton Aduaka. He was also a writer and producer on a feature film called Down to the Bone, and he is himself an immigrant coming to, to America from France in his teenage years. Yes? Familiar territory. Next to him is Dr. Alexandra Pineros Shields. She is director of organizing at the Massachusetts Immigration and Refugee Advocacy Coalition, um, one of the supporters of this film festival. She's worked in immigration services and advocacy for 25 years with organizations including the Irish Immigration Center, Centro Presente, Catholic Charities Immigration, and the Central American Refugee Center in Washington, D.C. She's lived and worked overseas in places like the Soviet Union and China. And her, her research interests include immigration, civic participation, immigrant civic participation, and the effects of globalization on human rights, a very interesting, complicated topic. And next to me, finally, is Lori, not finally, but next to me, is Lori Carafone, who is pro bono coordinator in Boston for the organization Kids in Need of Defense, KIND. You saw them credited on this film as well. Um, Lori has worked as an attorney in humanitarian immigration law since 2009. She's represented asylum seekers. She's worked as a litigator in Boston. And is, is there, there's a list of honors here that include Ford Outstanding Women Law Scholar and Boston Magazine's Rising Star in the Nonprofit Sector Award. So, whew, keeping busy. And finally, we have someone you recognize on the far end of this panel, which is Brandon Garcia, who was in the film. Um, we were supposed to have a second student as well, but she was unable to come. But we have, at least we have Brandon to fill us in on what's been happening since this film ended in 2012. So let me start with a question um, to US panelists. When you were, I think not for you because you're in the film, but when you're watching this film, what did you see that most spoke to you in the film, that most impressed you either as an immigrant or as someone working in the field? What's, what resonated for you? Whatever order, whoever. Um, I guess I would say um, just sort of the commonality of sort of the banality of what you go through as a high school student and just sort of the universality of it. Um, and thinking about, um, you know, when each of us were in that circumstance, um, trying to integrate all of these other multiplicative complications, um, it just sort of took me back to that time and thinking about all of the mistakes that I made and that everyone made. Um, and just thinking about how um, for the young people in that film, it seemed like there was so much more at stake in even the smallest errors that all of us made. Um, so I think um, the humanity of that was really brought home to me. Mm. Outside. 
Yes, I, I think building upon that um, is uh, the, you know, it's a time when you're trying to figure out who you are. It's about identity building. And, um, and as an immigrant, um, there's another layer of uh, figuring out uh, where you stand. Because really, you have one foot in another country, your, your uh, place of birth, um, or for refugees, you know, ref some refugee camp. Um, and then a foot here, and you're neither from there nor from here. Um, and, and I myself am an immigrant, and so I, it, I, it was very uh, close to home, the experience. I came when I was five. Uh, but even, even now, I, I, and with you know, English that you would not think, I was um, not native born. But I, even 45 years later, um, it's still a, a, a balancing act. Um, and so it, it's the, the, the double kind of layer of being a teenager and figuring out who you are, but also being an immigrant and trying to figure out your identity. Um, is, you, caught, you caught it very powerfully. Um, it was very vivid. It, it, was, it really touched my heart because I've been there. So uh, I think it was magnificent the way um, you captured it. Did you, did, were you bringing your immigrant experience to this, Jean-Michel? I did, and I didn't realize how much of it I was bringing until I was deeply into the film. Um, I've made in the past other films that deal with youth, and that's what kind of led me into that. At first, I was interested in, sh in actually shooting in like five different high schools around the country, just to see what the experience of coming to this country it might be if you come to New York, or if you come to the South, or if you come to suburbia. And then I live in New York, and as I'm doing my research, people say, oh, look at this school. This school is kind of trying something. Or it's a school that has made the choice of working with those kids. And then I went there, found a place which was so safe that allowed the kids to be who they are and allowed them to kind of explore who they are. So that led me to, to go and film in that place. And the more I film in that place, the closer it brought me back to when I was 16 and when I moved here. Going exactly through what you describe and going through what all of those kids are, were going through, being a teenager, moving from one place to another, another country, when you're a teenager, when you're starting to figure out who you are in your home, 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 and then your parents, you know, kind of decide, okay, let's move somewhere else. But this somewhere else is new language, new culture, new new code, new everything. Uh, so it goes back to, to what you were saying, and I think that's what we, we try to build and to show. Uh, teenager, first and foremost, trying to figure out what the hell is going on uh, with your parents, with yourself, with, with the world, but on top of that, uh, that extra layer of, of a new culture, a new language, new place. Uh, but at the end of the day, teenagers. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that what resonated with you, uh, yeah. Are there other ways in which immigration is different for children and teenagers than it is for adults? Do you, do you, do you have a sense of this from, from your work? Well, I, I could speak to that sort of from a a legal framework, but trying to sort of put it in, in non-legal terms. Um, so um, there are opportunities, uh, um, again, um, that you sort of have to grab hold of right at the, the right moment. So um, that would allow someone who comes into the country as a youth, um, generally under 18, to be able to stay here um, and either avoid deportation or even better, there are some laws, and one in particular that's a special visa just for minors that would allow you eventually to get your green card and then your citizenship. And so I often say when I'm meeting with, um, with the kids um, and their family members are in the intake with us, um, that I really wish that law applied to everyone um, because you can sort of see in the room mom or aunt or sister um, who's past that point. Um, and so um, it's a great opportunity, but I think it also is sort of this um, double-edged sword where there's a burden and sort of all of the hopes of the family are put on the young person who then has this opportunity that they do not have. So I'm sure I see Brandon smiling. Yes, I, yes, I was going to say, <laughs> Brandon, was that part of your, uh, the burden that you were feeling at this uh, time? Well, basically it's kind of... Uh, uh, it's true. Well, I, 
All I was smiling for was because uh, once I uh, hear my mom telling me that I have this great future here and then I could become so many things, it kind of so it kind of it kind of puts so much load on me, but at the same time I feel good because I myself could do something for my family, and at the same time uh, I see the difference between like when I came here, I have so many uh, so many opportunities to go for like going to school and getting so many uh, things like when you come here it's free school. You're, uh, you get access to so many things, but for example, when my dad or uh, my stepdad uh, came and my uncles came here, they couldn't go to sc uh, school or, or do something else or any other thing that I could do now, because they had to work. They had a they had to pay their their trip because nothing is free. So they had to pay their their like what the trip cost and besides that they had a uh, save money to send back to Guatemala and when once I see that is kind of what a, a privilege I have and so many things like in the movie I have done and then that's where so many turns in my life and I start realis realizing so many things but it, this doesn't happen until you actually experience and do a mistake. And it, everything is just so many, so it compacts together. <laughs> it, it, it's all compressed on yeah. top of you. Alexandra, let me ask you also the same question of the differences in, in the experiences of um, younger and older immigrants in your experience. Yeah. Well, um, you know, there, the, let me just do a specific case which I've had some experience with and, um, or a specific set of cases. Um, there is some allusion in the film to sexual orientation and um, remembered um, speaking at a, a, a conference uh, around um, youth um, who I, um, identify other than heterosexual and um, because since 1965 the, the, the main kind of structure of our immigration law is family-based petitions um, there um, are many cases in which um, when children um, when teenagers come out um, are um, so, so, so it happens across the board that sometimes um, when young people come out, they're dis, dis owed, so owed, is that the disowned. right? Disowned from their families. Um, in the case of an immigrant family, um, that the, child's are, the children are derivatives in a case, and so their, their access to a green card, um, and there are exceptions, which you've mm -hmm. just mentioned, um, is because they are related to the petitioner, which is a parent, um, um, there was many cases in which the children were taken off the petition. And so that left a, a, these young people without access to um, legal status, without an ac access to uh, getting a green card and, and having, um, um, so, so some of them were homeless, as well as being undocumented, right? So among the homeless youth population, there's um, uh, many of these children, but in addition, being undocumented. So it was a, a, a different layer. Um, so yeah. that's just one example yeah. of another way that it's different. Not that, not that we're having um, any, any great progress on immigration reform in this country at the current moment, but is that well, part of the... Um, effort that people in favor of immigration reform are talking about, the ways in which children are advantaged or disadvantaged, the ways in which families are, are um, struggling within, within this uh, current system? Well, one piece um, that you know, my organization, Kids in Need of Defense, um, especially the people at the headquarters in DC have really been advocating for um, is uh, something that's on the table which would actually provide for um, free legal counsel for all 
children in immigration proceedings. Um, at the moment, more than half of children who are going through immigration proceedings do not have representation. So you can imagine um, trying to, uh, you know, not speaking the language, being in a very complicated forum, and trying to understand the law and present your case, um, it's very unlikely that you will in fact win and be able to stay, even though it might be very dangerous um, or not in your best interest to go back. Um, and so actually there are a whole slew of um, people at firms and corporations who are willing to do the work for free but need you know, supervision. So one thing is um, a piece that would provide funding for that. Um, and so that would make it sort of more equivalent to if you're arrested and you're convicted and you're, and you're accused of a crime, you get a lawyer no matter if you can afford one or not, but um, if you're a six-year-old child, and you've probably seen you know, um, articles in the Times, it's been coming up a lot, um, you know, kids walking in court with just a sign on them, you know, my name is Jose and no one to speak for them. So that would be a major change if that was implemented. And, and very interesting. Mm -hmm. Did, I, I just wanted to yeah. add, um, I, I mean, I, it's also uh, relevant to, most of our work is with adults. It's relevant to adults as well. Immigration courts are not in the judicial branch of government. They're in the executive branch of government. They're administrative courts. And so uh, immigration offenses, such as in, in the film you saw uh, uh, some people who were undocumented, some young people, others that were afraid of becoming undocumented, of get, being out of status. Um, so, so being undocumented is an, it's a, an, an you know, immigration offense. But it's not a criminal offense. So if you're undocumented or in the press you hear the word illegal, we don't like to use that word. Um, and in and, and the press, um, it, illeg being illegal or undocumented is synonymous with crime, with being a criminal, with having co committed a crime. But in fact, technically, it isn't a crime. It's, it's not part of the criminal code. It's not even part of the civil code. It's an administrative violation. And so um, immigrants, uh, definitely the children, but even the parents, the adults, don't have a right to a lawyer. They don't have a right to remain silent. They don't have a right to a trial. Uh, they're, you know, a jury of their peers because they, immigration offenses are not in the criminal code. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting that, that you don't have that sense of blockage at the high school itself. Was the, is the high school at all snarled up in these legal issues or do they have a system? Uh, uh, is that not an issue for for schools? They don't, school don't ask. They don't ask. School public school don't ask. Uh huh. They're, they're not allowed to. They're, ask. they're not, they're allowed, not allowed, to. allowed to ask. Uh huh. But that's not universal. <laughs> uh -huh. um, that I think that yeah. school is a wonderful place um, and it's um, unique. In so a lot this is of ways. a don't ask, don't tell situation. Or if they no, knew, would no, it matter? Just by, um, you don't when you're in high school that you don't. The statue of the public high school do not ask the statue of the, the student. Mm -hmm. Do not ask, doesn't need to ask. It's a public school mm -hmm. which welcome and is supposed to welcome anyone regardless of their statue, whether they're visa or they're documented or not. Uh, that's what define a public school. A free public school it, it needs, is a welcoming school by nature. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes more of an issue when you go to university. I was going to ask. And that's where, uh, when we started to film the debate, or we started to film three years ago or so, uh, the debate around immigration was about borders. Within three years, that debate has shifted. And it's actually the children of immigration, the dreamers, that have shifted that debate. The dreamers, as you know, are undocumented students that were brought here at a very young age by their parents have gone through the education system here. Many of them have been wonderful students. And then they've played by the rule. Then they go to university. And at universities, they cannot access to uh, financial help. So university become very pricey. Some universities don't want any of them, don't take undocumented children. Um, so those kids say, no more. We've, we've played by your rules, and we are here to stay. We are Americans undocumented, but Americans. And they've been able to really shift the debate. And they're the ones that have led uh, and that have led the reform. You know, if, if we are in a stage where reform can be passed today, it's because of the children of immigration. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Should I take some questions? Are there questions from the audience? Or I, we can keep talking here forever, but um, if, if, if is an, uh, somebody here? One of the things that um, really struck me, and maybe Brandon can um, talk to this since you were there, is that people were so accepting of each other, like the um, Muslim young women who were talking about the prom, and they, but they felt, eventually they felt comfortable and people supported them. And like, um, is it Sandra, where her friends went into tuxes. I mean, I was just totally overwhelmed. Is that typical of the school? And uh, I mean, it's like, I think we all need to learn from them. It's like, Um, that would help world peace, I think. (laughs) Well, it it is typical in our school. Well, it is really, when once we came, we come in there, we have this, well, welcoming, and basically every teacher becomes your friend, and we kind of get this relationship with everybody that uh, uh, we get to a point that we're not afraid of sharing things because we share the same experiences and sometimes same thoughts. Like uh, me and Sandra are we became good friends uh, through soccer. Uh, soccer is worldwide, as you can see. And sorry for those that are here and not watching the Red Sox games. <laughs> but yeah, as you see, there's so many things that connect to us. And um, well, I don't know. I Once I come in, in there, I see that some students need help. Well, I like to help when I can and learn from them, uh, learn from many different cultures. And uh, well, that's probably one thing that help us each other, uh, to connect to ourselves and then to share things. And we feel comfortable because we know that we're not lonely and there's somebody that shares the same experiences with you. I think that that cooperation is part of the culture of the school. It's encouraged at the school. Little example, for example, nine and 10 graders are in the same classes. The kid that might just arrive uh, is going to be helped by the kid that has been there for two years. Um, the home language or, uh, is, is allowed, uh, meaning that the kid that might be coming from Pakistan that doesn't speak, well, in the classroom, it is okay if the older kid from Pakistan help him using that language. Um, also, it's recognized within that culture that all of us kids have coming with so much language, culture, and that's put on the table as well. That's seen as an advantage, not as a disadvantage. Uh, And therefore, that is also kind of reinforced. Um, But a lot of the cooperation, you step into those classrooms, I mean, we didn't really uh, zoom in onto the system itself. That was not the point of the film. But, you know, you might have gotten a sense that the geography of the classroom is not a typical kind of geography of it. It's more really kind of based on cooperation. And you see people around the table from five, six different nations uh, just kind of trying to figure out and crack the same problem together. And ultimately, the problem they're trying to crack at first is English. That's their common message. Like, they are trying to figure out that strange language, which they don't know. And, uh, and together, they are try- trying to crack that one and really helping each other quite a lot. Uh, yeah. We weren't allowed to see it with someone that speaks the same language. So uh, he was kind of forcing us to know that person from that other country that speaks that other language and realize that they're not different. They're the same thing. You just speak in another language and that he probably has experienced what you have experienced. And and it was was great. I mean, I see a lot of my cousins that go to a high school and there's, their school is full of kids and he, his teachers don't even know him. But once I get into my school, everybody knows him. I know my deans, I know my teachers, and they know me really well. <laughs> and I just can't get over it. Sometimes you just want to like, <laughs> they were catching please you. don't know me. <laughs> they were catching you. Uh, you have another question you, here? Uh, I have a quick question about access. Uh, one of the things that I was absolutely amazed at 
was how you were able to get access into the into Brandon's home and into some mm -hmm. of the other homes where even in prayer, I mean, you were there and they accepted you. How did you do that? Um, I mean, it's a choice, meaning that time, the choice was to take time uh, and to allow time to kind of take over and then time is what allowed us to, to tell that story or, or to, to show who they are and then to invite them in that process. Uh, sometimes I say we could have made that film in two weeks, but you know, in two weeks you like get sound bites and you know, editing, we could have made something work. But ultimately what we went for was more some, I don't know if it's texture or whatnot, but just that, uh, establishing that relationship and what we film is that relationship. Um, but ultimately, uh, in line with that, you know, uh, people sometimes ask me, uh, how did you pick them? You know, like, no, no, they picked me. You know, meaning that it's, it's um, by spending enough time in the school, you kind of become part of the culture of the school. And then it's mutual curiosity. Uh, I'm as curious about what's going on in that place and how are they, how they are about, like, what is this guy doing here, you know? Uh, and I think that's where that, you know, Yes, the, the only person who seemed to notice you all the way through was Singh. He, no, he did not seem to ever, the, the, the rest of the students seemed to say, part of the wallpaper at a certain point. Yeah, yeah, but Singh, yeah, and I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's, I myself, I mean, I can tell you, yeah, each of, there's different tone in each of them and how the camera relate and how they relate to the camera and ultimately not to the camera, but to, to me and, and my, my co-director, uh, I think it's, yeah, each of them is a little bit, if you scratch a little bit over the surface of what you are seeing, you are literally messy seeing the relationship. Uh, and yeah, time, yeah, we started as fly on the walls, but the more time you spend there, and the less you are a fly, and, and ultimately what you are, where the story is taking place is in that relationship. Um, but ultimately, I think beyond that, that was allowed by the school. That kind of relationship, as you just described, exists between the teachers and the students. Um, you know, as soon as the day one, when I stepped in there, I was very surprised at how open everyone was, how safe of a place it is. And because there is safety in that relationship between teacher and student, learning and teaching is really taking place, real learning and real teaching. And ultimately, I would say that it's just, that work is just an extension of what was already there. Uh, and we took it a little bit further at home, outside of school, where teachers are not really allowed to, to go or don't go. Uh, but yeah, so. I mean, that just added wait, wait, wait. a whole yeah. other yeah. layer. One, mm -hmm. more, one more question back here. I'm curious, what do we know about the history of this school? How long has it been there? Who was the instigator? Okay, is it yeah, a charter yeah. school? It's not a charter school. It's a public school. It's considered a public school. Charter it's, schools are public schools. They, they are, yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not considered a charter school. Um, and uh, there is, actually, I gave you a little card. Um, in the back, there is a name, one of the organization, one of our partner organization, is the International Network for Public Schools which is an organization, NGO, that has kind of developed that model. Uh, there is 10 schools like that around New York City. There is two of them in Oakland, San Francisco. They're opening one in Utah. They're looking into putting it in other places. Um, and again, I think it was just uh, some teacher, ESL teacher, that asked themselves the question, how, how much further can we go? How much more welcoming can we be? Uh, how much, how, what does it need to be done to put the kid at the foreground? Um, and yeah, so I invite you all of, the, all of you to, on the side, there, there is, you know, kind of go on uh, our site, Alert America, and follow the link to that specific organization where they do have all kind of information about what they are doing, what kind of service, and, and kind of the philosophy behind it as well. You know? yeah. may, I ask, ooh, may I ask a quick question of Brandon before yeah. we stop? Go ahead. Brandon, I was very pleased to see at the end of the film that you were back in school. <laughs> and your story was um, very intense, and I wondered if you could just say something about how did you get yourself back there and how's your senior year? It is your senior year, isn't it? Uh, no. No? I'm, I'm actually in college now. Oh! <laughs> Fabulous. 
and uh, going through my first semester. I have my midterm due Monday. <laughs> and, uh, so, but yeah, it's basically, like I said, it's just a big turn where you have to experience things to realize what you actually have and what you actually want to do in life. When I went through work, like work, <laughs> and, and I still do, I, I work part-time student, part, uh, I part-time have a job, and it's just how much I can do if I pull, like, uh, if I pull my head into it. And sometimes you have dreams, we all do, and sometimes you don't like, achieve what you want but you can achieve in another way. I didn't realize that I liked architecture until my junior year, where uh, junior, starting junior year, and then my senior year, I went to the, into a program where I worked uh, with a mentor that was in architecture, and actually work on uh, uh, doing uh, plants and uh, all architecture stuff. And I liked it a lot. And then soccer was kind of like coming out a little bit out of my life. And, but I still love it. I still play, I still practice it. Uh, and it's just a simple matter of uh, my, like the, like the push that my parents gave me, like that support that every child should get from their parents. It's really important when you're like turning into this like part of your life when you start in college. And right now I'm really happy because I'm doing something that I like. And when once I go home and, and do my homework, it's not homework, it's something that I'm gonna do in life and that I like to do. Great, so, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we could close on anything better than that, could we? Yeah, and, and, oh, and, and Brendan has a, a new girlfriend too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm back. But coming here, she was very jealous, and she asked me to make sure that if you have a crush on Brendan, oh. stay away. <laughs> Thank you very Judith, much. Judith, I'm wondering if I could just uh, make one comment. Um, yep. Jean-Michel, I, I was just taken with mm -hmm. the timing of the film and how you allowed the space for the, the children to be able to express very difficult, um, dif difficult emotions. And a, a lot of that was transmitted just through that silent time of just sitting with them and allowing them to come to what they wanted or could come, you know, find the words to say. So I very much appreciated that. That's very unique because most mm -hmm. filmmakers want to fill every bit of space. <laughs> it was pleasant. Thank you and thank you. Then yes. to be courageous enough and to th And thank you to the Arlington yeah. Film Festival for inviting yeah. this film yeah. and panel here. Did you have something else you wanted yeah, to add? Or, or Please. Well, quick, yeah. Can I just say quick, yeah. that the fact that we actually, well, you're at school, you have a regular day, and then you see him coming inside the door with a camera. <laughs> And then I'm like, what is he doing? And then you see, you hear the rumors that they're gonna film a movie. And the first thing that pops up to your head is like an action movie where it all happens. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, so you have this big imagination. But then once you get an idea that he, he, somebody actually read your story and was interested in you and wants to know the way you think and wants to share it out, that's something that you shouldn't let go at all because there is a reason why he came to you and probably there isn't somebody that wants to share like that. There, there isn't somebody that wants to share your, their culture, but like, like they don't want to share it even though it's beautiful. Like I bet so many, everybody has something that uh, in, in the background that is really important to everybody and maybe they're afraid to sh share it they're like caught up so into like uh, I don't know how you say it like mm, it's like well, once I see my cousin he's so different because he's so American but I'm so like I love my culture and I like sharing things with him but he's still like oh come on 
I want him to share the, feel the same thing I feel because his parents are from Guatemala too and he should like uh, at least um, have a, a little bit of a culture, but he's so American. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. but yeah, I mean, that's one thing that also, you know, we learn as we make that, uh, and that's clear for everyone, that the power of storytelling and, and story sharing, and there is great empowerment with that. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, five of you, by allowing to spend time with you, you know, you, you allowed yourself to, to share that story. And I think there was an, a certain empowerment as well that came along with that, you know. Um, and uh, I'm just saying that as a segue to the card and kind of as a conclusion to, to I give you a card and uh, the film, you know, we've been showing the film in different parts of the country, people like it, they clap, they relate to those kids, but what we're also asking is like to go beyond that. Uh, as you saw, you know, uh, those five kids are just million, uh, five amongst millions. And uh, we invite you to get involved, uh, as we talked about already. And it's great to have actually organizations that are involved and very actively involved with uh, children of immigration. Uh, the card is kind of showing you very simple steps that can be taken, uh, that you can take. And uh, one of them is to share the film. Share the film to your high school, maybe your community high school, or to the high school that you went to. Because as we show the film around the country, we realize that a lot of schools don't know what to do. Um, and in many ways, the film, by saying, well, they're teenagers, just deal with them as teenagers, uh, and make the choice of, of being welcoming, make the choice that this school has made. Uh, and it's a simple choice, it's just like commitment you know, of some kind. Uh, and so if we can share the film with as many schools as possible, maybe we, we'll get a point across, you know? Support organizations like, like KIND, like MIRA, uh, with whom we've been working actually with, with such organization to turn again the film into a tool, a discussion, a discussion tool. And as well in school, what we've been doing, uh, when teenagers see that film, they really kind of relate and they want to tell their story. And uh, one of the things that we've been doing in school has been a kind of a encouraging through workshops and whatnot, people to share their story. Um, see, I'm, I'm a, there is a link there to a website, a partner website called Immigrant Nation. Uh, and the website is, is really kind of asking people to share their own immigration story. We all have an immigration story, whether it's in the past or the present. We all have a relation, some kind of relation to immigration. Uh, and the more we talk about it as our common story, the more I think the debate will firmly shift. Uh, and then the the idea of borders, militarized borders, and all that will completely kind of go away. Uh, we are a land of immigration. Those children are here to stay. And the way we fare in welcoming them will define who we are for the years to come. Uh, and there is a chance right now because of this reform to really kind of make, make a stand, take a stand. So get involved. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay for the next film. There's another film starting soon. He but the panelists don't. Um, How is your experience now that you are in college? Well, my experience now <laughs> that I'm in college is way different than high school. Uh, it's more into what I want to do and what I want to achieve than just coming into high school and uh, learning basic things. Of, uh, it's different. Uh, like Sandra said, we have to be a little bit more mature, more responsible, but at the same time, do what you want to do and like learn what you want to do so you can get the living. Like, you know, work for something that you're going to work for. Not get a job, but get a career. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something you want to do in life. Yeah. Thank you. And if you have Facebook, Come and like us on Facebook so we can keep <laughs> update and then you can even connect with Brandon on Facebook. How you get down so fast? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.